You're listening to another podcast. A podcast not only of reviewing and discussing, but of discovery. A deep dive into a classic show whose influence is immeasurable. Your next stop, Anthology. Hello and welcome to Anthology, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. I'm your host, Matt Hurt, and if this is your first time listening, Anthology is a podcast where I review The Twilight Zone as a first-time viewer and other classic and contemporary science fiction anthology series. For more, or for archives of all of my episodes, visit AnthologyPod.com. You can also like the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash AnthologyPod, and follow me on Twitter and Instagram at OVAnthologyPod. And if you'd like to support what I do here, you can become a patron at Patreon.com slash obsessive viewer where you can get access to exclusive b-roll episodes tv and book reviews movie reaction recordings commentary tracks and early access to podcast episodes spread across all three of the podcasts that i do over at obsessiveviewer.com and while i have tons and tons and tons of audio content on patreon spread across those three podcasts um if you're looking for a more curated sci-fi experience, you can join the Patreon at the special $4 sci-fi tier. That is the tier where I basically have curated all of the science fiction related content on Patreon to that one tier. So you'll get access to commentary tracks for movies like Ex Machina, Sunshine, The Matrix, Dune. You'll also get TV reactions like episode TV reactions for shows like Dark, For All Mankind, Foundation, The Last of Us, Severance, Stranger Things. You'll also get book reactions and movie reactions. Recently, I did a movie reaction for Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, but I also have content on there regarding The Thing from Another World, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, After Yang, Don't Worry Darling, a whole bunch of stuff. So again, um, you can find that at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Um, All the money I make on Patreon goes to paying the fees to keep the podcast running and is greatly appreciated. And again, you can join at the $4 science fiction specialty tier if you just want uh, anthology related content. I think I'm, I'm hoping to do more science fiction stuff on there. So like I just read War of the Worlds, so I might do something on there uh, for the book War of the Worlds. I'm also really, really wanting to get back into the Expanse book series. Um, I might do like a sprawling thing there. So the only time will tell. We'll, we'll see. So anyway, again, that's at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. And today on the show, this is my 100th main anthology episode. And What kind of sucks about it is that I am clearly like going through a cold or something. I had a very, very bad um, sore throat yesterday, all day yesterday, and then today it is finally kind of subsiding enough to where I feel like I can record, but nevertheless, um, so there's going to be a lot of that, and I really hope that I don't bother you guys with that, but anyway, uh, nevertheless, I'm here. I'm recording episode 100 of the main feed. This is like I have episode like 163 of the podcast itself when you include the bonus episodes and everything. But I'm really proud that I'm, I've done 100 episodes covering now 101 Twilight Zone episodes out of the 156 episodes that it had. So it's just it's so like I, I had like a weird like existential crisis um, when I went over the halfway point of the series and now it's like, okay, now I have like, after this episode, I'll have like, what, 55 more episodes to go. And that's just crazy. So I have plans for what I'm going to do after covering the Twilight Zone and everything on the podcast. That's why I named it Anthology and not like the Twilight Zone, uh, anything related to the Twilight Zone. But anyway, again, I really apologize for my throat. Um, So today on the show, uh, like I said, it's the 100th episode. I'm going to be covering the 101, 101st uh, episode of The Twilight Zone. Uh, Cavender is coming. It's the 36th and penultimate episode of The Twilight Zone's third season, and it originally aired on May 25th, 1962. And of course, I'll be rounding out the episode with a brief review of Science Fiction Theater Season 2, Episode 3, the episode called Who Is This Man? Which, spoiler alert for that bonus review at the end, that was a cool episode. I really like that episode. So check that out if you haven't already. Um, but before I get into all of that and get into the episode proper, um, I'm going to share some thoughts from the world of fiction and science and just kind of run down some things that I have watched or uh, participated in in terms of science fiction. 
And uh, yeah, let me just go through this list here. Um, first, I've been, uh, since I got sick, um, which by the way, I took like a COVID test this morning. I was negative. I'm going to work from home tomorrow just to be safe because uh, I don't want to like give anyone a cold or anything. Um, but um, yeah, so in 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 the sense that I wanted to record, I had like a whole list of things that I wanted to record for Patreon and for Anthology. And I just couldn't because my throat was like on fire. I decided, okay, well, maybe I'll just play some Mass Effect. Um, <clears throat> so I played, I started another playthrough of Mass Effect. If you're not familiar, Mass Effect is a science fiction uh, video game that is fantastic. It's a great like trilogy. They have like also Mass Effect Andromeda, which I never really played. But I talked about it previously on the podcast a couple of years ago when the when the Legendary Edition came out, which was a remaster for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One or whatever the system is. Um, but it's my favorite video game series, and I decided to play through it again. And it's a lot of fun. Um, this is my first time playing as Fem Shep, uh, and I'm doing a Renegade playthrough, so we'll see how that uh, turns out. But also, I don't know how much time I'm going to actually spend playing it, but it's a good distraction when I'm trying not to uh, when I'm trying not to, when I'm trying not to struggle to breathe through a terrible, uh, sore throat. So, um, <clears throat> maybe I'll check in later with that on another episode. Uh, who's to say, but yeah, I'm enjoying it and I really like Mass Effect. Um, the other, the, the next thing on my list is that I did see Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. As I said, it is, I do have a non-spoiler immediate reaction on Patreon, but I also wrote a full review on obsessiveviewer.com and Tiny and I reviewed it on the Obsessive Viewer podcast, episode 390. Um, and I'll just say, since I've, since I've covered it extensively, um, in the week since I've seen it, or in the several days, since, well, yeah, weeks since I've seen it, um, it's fine. It's I, I kind of ended up having a pretty negative uh, review of it, um, just because it just seems a little bit, a little bit clunky, and and uh, it, it just didn't feel like a like the fun heisty stuff of the first couple of Ant Man movies. Um, I was really into Jonathan Major's introduction as King the Conqueror, but I kind of feel like it could have he could have used a better movie for for him to be introduced to 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 the MCU since it's a big uh, sprawling thing that's going to lead to the Kang dynasty and and you know him being the focal villain of the uh of the multiverse saga. So anyway, read more about it on obsessiveviewer.com or listen to my thoughts on obsessiveviewer the podcast or join Patreon, but those are my thoughts on Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania. And then a few other things I want to say. I just want to give a quick shout out to Mike, who is on. Uh, he's a Patreon supporter. Um, he he joined. He rejoined Patreon and had some very kind words about my commitment to the Twilight Zone. And I just want to just highlight that because it's always incredibly nice to hear positive feedback from people who have been fans of the Twilight Zone much longer than I have. Like I started this podcast in 2015. Um, having not seen the Twilight Zone. And even though now I am, you know, 101 episodes into the Twilight Zone, and I feel like I've, I feel like I've earned my, <laughs> earned my, earned my wings as a fan of the Twilight Zone, as it were. Um, I still feel like very, very touched and humbled when, when, you know, the real fans um, reach out and, and compliment my uh, commitment to it. So anyway, thank you, Mike. And I hope you enjoy the Patreon goodies um, on Patreon. Uh, and then a few other things as well. Um, the Outer Limits podcast. My friend Victor Gamboa, uh, he and I will be doing a crossover episode soon, and I am so excited about it. So here's what happened. Um, we were exchanging some tweets on Twitter, and he had mentioned... Oh, that's what it was, because I had, I had tweeted about how I had just watched this episode, and then... Uh, the changing of the guard and how I wasn't I, I wasn't aware that Donald Pleasance was in an episode of the changing of the guard or uh, an episode of the Twilight Zone. And so Victor said like, yeah, he was, you know, he was also in uh, Outer Limits, which I've seen that episode, the man with the power. Uh, f f awesome episode. Um, <laughs> but 
but anyway, we got to talking, and we're going to do a crossover episode of Anthology and the Outer Limits podcast, where we talk about actors who appeared in both The Twilight Zone and The Outer Limits. Uh, Victor has done a lot of legwork to put to put the notes together and everything, and I am going to be watching a lot of stuff uh, of The Outer Limits, and we're going to have a very, it, it's going to be a very fun conversation. I think we're going to cross post it between The Outer Limits podcast and Anthology, so that'll be one of my like in-between seasons episodes. So that's going to be coming out soon. Very excited. Can't wait to ch- chat with Victor. He's such a good guy. And uh, and I'm really excited uh, to be on the podcast again. Uh, speaking of on podcasts again, um, <laughs> uh, Brandon Cruz uh, from Submitted for Your Approval, he has brought back his Submitted for Your Approval podcast, his uh, Twilight Zone podcast that I've been a guest on a few times, and he's been a guest on here. Um, he recently relaunched Sub- Submitted for Your Approval, and... I am going to be a guest on that show very soon. Um, I'm going to be helping him to review To Serve Man, uh, which I'm very excited about. So check that out. Go ahead and subscribe to Submitted for Your Approval if you haven't already. It's a great podcast, and he's a good guy, and I can't wait to be on the show. And speaking of Brandon uh, and in in in-between season episodes of Anthology, Brandon is going to be continuing the tradition. Um, we're going to be continuing continuing the transition on anthology of uh, the tradition of uh, on anthology of having Brandon on to talk about the Twilight Zone season overall. So I'm really happy that this all kind of worked out the way it did because he's relaunching Submitted for Your Approval as I am about to finish season three of the Twilight Zone. So he is going to be on to talk about season three overall with me. So I can't wait to get that worked out and everything. And my final thing from the world of fiction and science is that I recently found out that uh, Sam Esmail is uh, doing a series adaptation of the Fritz Lang uh, movie Metropolis for Apple TV+. Um, so basically the article that I read said that he is developing this new take on Metropolis as a showrunner and executive producer. He's writing the series and he is also expected to direct most of the uh, episodes himself as he did with his previous series, Mr. Robot. So, um, I bring that up because A, I have never seen Metropolis and, um, B, I really didn't like Mr. Robot when I saw of it. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm curious about this. Um, I did just recently resubscribe to the Criterion channel and I do plan on watching Metropolis soon. Um, I did previously watch Fritz Lang's M for our Ebert's Great Movies list project on The Obsessive Viewer, and I enjoyed it, so I've always wanted to see Metropolis, and I've wanted to see it, especially after seeing M. But this gives me more incentive to watch Metropolis, and I'll probably do a Patreon thing for it, or what have you, um, or talk about it in a in a segment um, upcoming in an upcoming episode of this podcast. But uh, something I do want to mention is that I do really appreciate the way that Apple TV Plus seems very much committed to doing science fiction things, like they did Foundation, Severance, um, <clears throat> and a bunch of other stuff that I'm blanking on right now. But uh, but yeah, so it's just it's interesting, and we'll see what happens with that. So okay, so now that we have. Uh, that I've told you guys stories about the world of fiction and science. Let me go ahead and go into my review of Cavender is Coming. And before I get into the actual plot summary and everything, of course, I'm going to share what I knew before going into this episode. And what I knew was really nothing. Um, I The only thing that I had was that Cavender is an interesting name. And for some reason, it made me think that it could be an, uh, about an alien or a gangster like, uh, the example that I had was that maybe Cavender is some kind of alien whose arrival will bring about some big change for humanity, like in The Gift. Or maybe this is a gangster story where someone botches a job and they have to wait for the boss, Cavender, uh, to show up to reprimand them, sort of like Nervous Man in a $4 room, and then something Twilight Zoning happens. So, <clears throat> overall, I was way off, and, uh, I had no idea, obviously, but I do think it's interesting that I drew from two different Twilight Zone episodes uh, to to kind of guess at what this episode could be, when the actual episode itself is very much a rehash of season one's Mr. Beavis. And I'm going to say up front, before I get to the plot summary, that I did not like this episode. This episode was such a... It just, it didn't work for me on on numerous levels that I'll get into in this review, but it was just, it was not to my liking. So... 
I'm going to do my best to be as objective as possible and to be as thorough as possible, but this episode really did not work for me. So um, having said all of that, let me go into the plot summary, courtesy of The Twilight Zone, Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic by Martin Grahams Jr. Of course, I'm going to be spoiling the entirety of the episode from here on out, so if you haven't seen Cavender is Coming, please watch it and then come back and listen or what have you. So here we go, the plot summary, courtesy of Twilight Zone, Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic. An angel named Cavender is granted one final chance to earn his wings. His mission is to venture down to Earth and be the guardian angel for Agnes Grepp, a woman best described as unstable and unresolved, but who in who can cannot hold a job longer than a few hours. She is, however, well loved by the tenants of the apartment house, a Thursday night bowler, and always a few months behind on in her rent. Offering aid and advice for a period of 24 hours, Cavender creates a number of miracles, independent wealth, a mansion, and making Agnes a prominent member of society. After tasting a bit of the high life, however, she longs for her friends, the junk-filled apartment she resided in, and the life she led before the divine intervention. Cavender is puzzled until Agnes begs for her life uh, to be returned the way it was. <laughs> that was a terrible pause there. <laughs> uh, she was happy before the miracles. Uh, Cavender consents and then returns to heaven where his superior explains that cash and contentment are not necessarily synonymous. Seeing how Agnes is happier than she was before, Cavender is assigned another lost soul. This episode stars Jesse White as Harmon Cavender. This is his second of two Twilight Zone uh, appearances. We previously saw him in Once Upon a Time as the repairman. Um, He is also in the unofficial Twilight Zone pilot, The Time Element, from 1958. And he also was in Rod Serling's The Yellow Canary in 1963. And uh, co-starring as Agnes Grepp is Carol Burnett. Uh, She is an absolute legend. This was her only episode of The Twilight Zone. She is a legend of television and comedy. Uh, She she has received 23 Primetime Emmy Award nominations, uh, six wins for her work in The Gary Moore Show, um, Julie and Carol at Carnegie Hall, the Carol Burnett, Carol, Burnett, Carol Burnett show and Mad About You. And she has also received 18 Golden Globe Award nominations, uh, winning seven of them for the Carol Burnett show. Uh, she also received three Tony Awards and three G- Grammy nominations, winning or uh, three, sorry, three Tony Award nominations and, and three uh, Grammy Award nominations, winning one of each, which is weird because that, by my count, that is, she's like an Oscar away from an EGOT, right? Because Emmy Awards, Golden Globe, or Emmy, Emmy, Tony, Grammy, she needs an Oscar. So anyway, <clears throat> she's also received various honors, including two Peabody Awards, a Screen Actors Guild Life Achievement Award, and a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Uh, let's see, in... 2005, she received the Presidential Medal of Freedom awarded to her by President George W. Bush. And in 2013, she received the Mark Twain Prize for American Humor. And uh, in 2019, she became the first recipient of the Carol Burnett Lifetime Achievement Award for Television, which was named in her honor. Um, she's got tons of credits. I recently, as in within the last couple of years, saw her in Noises Off. Uh, the movie, but she obviously is very well known for the Carol Burnett show, which ran for 286 episodes between 1967 and 1978. Um, the that show, uh, the first, weirdly enough, only the first three seasons are available on Peacock. But if you want to watch some uh, more of the Carol Burnett show, all seasons are available as of this recording on Freevee um, with ads. So. Uh, seek that out there. Um, and then also, I do want to mention that she was in uh, the Gary Moore show. Um, and in season three, episode 31, which aired on May 8th, 1961, uh, Rod Serling appeared um, in an episode. And so this is interesting. I couldn't find any, I couldn't find the clip on YouTube, but it is available on the DVD set. And I presume also the Blu-ray set for the series, but, um, it's basically a segment where they do kind of a spoof of the twilight zone. They call it the twine night zone. And the spoof episode is titled the mosquito. And basically it's Carol Burnett and someone else. I can't remember who it was. Um, they are speaking about Carol Burnett's character's husband being really drawn into his scientific work and everything, everything. And basically how he wants to, 
uh, transform himself into a mosquito, I think. Um, it was a really, really funny sketch, but it's interesting because Rod Serling, uh, he was apparently visiting the set um, just that day when they were doing that, when they were doing rehearsals. And uh, they were like, hey, what do you want to do like a, a spoof, a parody spoof of the introduction? Because we were going to have someone else do it, but you know, you're here. So he does, he does like his, ho- his own little uh, Rod Serling uh, uh, opening narration bit. It was really funny. So anyway, like I said, it's not available on YouTube that I could find, but it is on the DVD extras. And I recommend checking it out if you have that. Um, and then uh, let's see other actors in this episode. Howard Smith played Polk. This is his second of two Twilight Zone episodes. We previously saw him in A Stop at Willoughby. And finally, we have Frank Behrens as Stout. This was his only Twilight Zone episode. And uh, he was also in one episode of One Step Beyond, season two's, season two's Forked Lightning in 1959. Um, and I can't believe I didn't put down, uh, what's his name? The guy that was in uh, Night of the Meek. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember. But um, he's in this episode too. Writer for this episode was Rod Serling. And uh, and yeah, as I'm going to say in the episode proper, in the review proper, this episode was a rehash of Mr. Beavis. Um, like, it is it is almost the exact same plot, really. Um, and it was originally intended, much like Mr. Beavis was, it was originally intended to be a backdoor pilot for a series. However, instead of the guardian angel working with one person uh, throughout the series, as would have been the case with Mr. Beavis, Uh, The intention was for Jesse White to be the lead actor as Cavender, and each week he would get a new assignment. So that's why at the end of the episode, they say, like, you know, there are lots of people that you can help and everything. Um, So that's 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 kind of that was kind of the gimmick of of the of the. of the pilot episode that that was written. And Serling wrote that pilot episode with Carol Burnett in mind. And um, that's also why. Since Cavender was to be the lead of the series, that's why Jesse White got top billing and and Carol Burnett was special guest star. Um, In terms of the writing and the fallout, I guess, of it not getting picked up or anything, um, per Unlocking the Door to to a Television Classic, Rod Serling wrote a letter to Carol Burnett. Uh, This was on May 3rd. so per Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic, I'm going to read the letter that, or the excerpt of the letter that Rod wrote to Carol Burnett. Uh, this was on May 3rd after it was determined that the show wasn't moving forward. So Rod said, quote, I feel like Napoleon surveying the aftermath of Waterloo, except at least I get residuals. All he got was Elba. If this truly is the best of all possible worlds, I think I'll check with Greyhound to see if they have any trips to other galaxies. Um, And then uh, per unlocking the door, uh, Serling also added his valued opinion regarding the finished product, having recently previewed the final cut. Quote, the show you did for us is not good and it's not bad, which makes it lousy. With a combination of talents like yours and Jesse's, it should have been walloping. uh, It should have been walloping exceptional. That it isn't points up to the fact that you were done wrong by all concerned. The script, I guess, is part of the pr- part of the trouble, but even more c- culpable is the direction. This was quite the most heavy-handed, ham-fisted, squarest directing I've ever cried through. God knows when it's scheduled for, and I hope you'll be out on a ferry boat someplace and won't have to see it. I promise you that if given a second chance ever, I'll make it up. End quote. And holy crap, that is... That is, uh... That's something, man. <laughs> that's that's pretty wild. Um, uh, I don't think it was that bad, <laughs> but I do really think it wasn't that good. So, so I do appreciate the humility that Serling uh, exhibited for for Carol Burnett. But yeah, it this episode just doesn't really work all that well. But anyway, director for the episode, speaking of the directing, was Christian Nyby. This is his second of two Twilight Zone appearances or works. Uh, previously, he directed Showdown with Rance McGrew. And uh, yeah, of course, he also directed The Thing from Another World, um, uh, the, the film. But yeah, I this, apparently this is why I only got two episodes of the Twilight Zone. Um, that's pretty wild. But anyway, so with the talent rundown, rundown, and me pausing frequently to sneeze and clear my throat, um, let me go into my review of Cavender is Coming. 
So we open on Agnes Grep. Um, she is at work. I really thought that this was like some kind of like dancing uh, um, troupe or something. But she's not a dancer. She's an usher at, at a theater. Um, and she is kind of stumbling around. She's in front of a mirror. And then immediately the boss opens the door and knocks her down. It's very sudden, very slapsticky. And um, then right from there, we get a piece of Serling's opening narration, which I won't play right now because I'm going to get through the rest of it. But basically, um, this is just immediately telling us that this is a very comedic minded episode, another kind of comedy episode of The Twilight Zone, which historically doesn't necessarily work all that well. Um, so we'll see. And I have already kind of given a uh, tip my hat or tipped my hand here that I don't like this episode, but, but maybe, maybe in the discussion, I'll um, <laughs> kind of come about to reconsidering it. But anyway, um, the following after after Serling's brief uh, narration, we get a shot up to the sky where we see angels in heaven. Uh, so it's immediately revealed that, OK, Cavender is an angel who has not yet been given his wings. So he has 24 hours to improve Agnes's lot in life. And then the angels were, will reopen his case. And here's the thing. So <clears throat> I I don't like that this episode is very much a rehash of Mr. Beavis. And I don't like even more that it is just a kind of blatant riff or I don't I don't want to say rip off, but very heavily, you know, inspired by It's a Wonderful Life. I just don't think that I think the combination of it borrowing from It's a Wonderful Life and it being a complete rehash of an existing episode that previously was made as a backdoor pilot that wasn't you know, that didn't go forward, just makes this really, really hard to enjoy this episode, um, which is a shame because Carol Burnett is phenomenal. Like, it, she's she's fine in this episode, but she has that pedigree of com comedic timing that I just feel like she got such the short shrift uh, with this episode because she doesn't really give... Uh, get a lot of chances to to really exercise that, that comedic... the the comedic muscles that she is very well known for. So yeah, I don't know. But anyway, after that introduction of Cavender, we get Serling's opening narration, which I will play right now. Come on, girls, step it up, step it up, girls, don't loiter. Small message of reassurance to that horizontal young lady. Don't despair. Help is en route. It's coming in an odd form from a very distant place, but it's nonetheless coming. <laughs> Submitted for your approval, the case of one Miss Agnes Grepp, put on earth with two left feet, an overabundance of thumbs, and a propensity for falling down manholes. In a moment, she will be up to her jaw in miracles, wrought by apprentice angel Harmon Cavender, intent on winning his wings. And though it's a fact that both of them should have stood in bed, they will tempt all the fates by moving into the cold, gray dawn of the twilight zone. So a couple things about this uh, about this narration is one is that I think that it's interesting that I just reviewed like recently just reviewed Serling's Carol for Another Christmas, uh, which was an adaptation of A Christmas Carol. While this episode appears to be very much a riff on It's a Wonderful Life. So I just think the timing of that is pretty interesting. And also, uh, I wish that I would have timed it out to where I could have done this with uh, Carol for Another Christmas, but whatever. Um, and it's also really, really wild to me that this is the first time in the show that Serling says submitted for your approval um, in the series run. It's kind of crazy to me that we've gone this this far into the show with him saying without him saying that in the opening narration, um, because it, it is such just a uh, <clears throat> it's a it's such a an iconic phrasing for him with this show that it's it's insane that it's at the end of season three that it that it comes up for the first time. So anyway, I just thought that was kind of interesting. So uh, so yeah, so after the narration, just the overall music and the shot of the door opening on Agnes earlier really made me think that this would be a comedic episode. And I don't usually, like, I, I go in with an open mind with these episodes, but I know that when The Twilight Zone tries to do comedy, it doesn't necessarily work in its favor for me, uh, you know, usually. I mean... 
I I did end up I did end up really enjoying um oh uh Hocus Pocus and Frisbee and that's a pretty comedic episode and I liked the comedy of uh of um will the real Martian please stand up um with a guy at the counter and everything but for the most part when they have when when the show has like an episode that is completely like it is it is supposed to be a complete comedy it kind of falls a little flat for me so um I was a little bit nervous about this episode and frankly I'm kind of happy that it was that the episode didn't work for me for a variety of other reasons which I'll get to but um in addition to that opening scene just the buffoonish way that Cavender is painted by his fellow angels and that opening sequence also tipped its hat that you know this is a comedic episode so <clears throat> so the episode proper begins with there's a pre-show meeting for the usherettes at the theater and the boss kind of points out Agnes as the new one of the group and she seems overall pleased to be there she seems very uh she it's it's very much communicating her kind of bubbly personality uh which is good um but also kind of shows her kind of scattered kind of brain because he starts giving directions very rapid fire um <clears throat> and he's giving them directions on how to interact with customers who's going to go where it's very rapid fire, very, very quick. Um, and then Agnes, as everyone is leaving to go to their position, she stays behind when everyone is dismissed for, uh, to their positions. And I will say this, that if I had any doubt that this was, that this was a comedy episode, the, the, the telltale sign of the Twilight Zone doing a comedy episode appears at this moment when she goes, she goes out of the spotlight from where she's supposed to be. And then she turns around and we get that slide whistle sound effect, which is clearly like the Twilight Zone, like this is a comedy episode vroop, kind of thing. So anyway, um, <clears throat> she stands in the middle of the lobby and she struggles to take tickets and give directions. She keeps fumbling her words and she keeps fumbling uh, the directions and everything. It's clear that she's way out of her element. And then I can't remember exactly how this goes, but she then is like, she's trying to find the manager and then she just bursts through a mirror, uh, which I thought was kind of funny. And, and if it wasn't for the, uh, the window crash scene later in this episode, I would have thought that's kind of a fine little fun bit of comedy. Uh, but the twilight zone loves it's, you know, uh, windows and mirror shattering, um, uh, sequences. So it's nice that we had that there. I also do like that she has that kind of that kind of uh, humiliating moment where she's like, "What's the what's the code for I'm sorry or whatever?" I thought that was really funny and charming. Um, yeah. So, needless to say, she's fired. She goes. She's outside now, and she gets on a bus. But she even manages to bump into someone in the process of getting on the bus. So that is telling us that she's very clumsy. And really, that kind of reminds me of a penny for your thoughts and how. Dick York's character in that episode was kind of this level, lovably obtuse person about his situation and his surroundings. And I kind of wanted that to kind of come into play with Agnes in this episode, but I'll talk about it a little bit more here in a second about why it failed in that, in that regard for me as well. But she's on the bus and Cavender just suddenly appears in the seat next to her. And he says like, Hey, don't be afraid. I'm a guardian angel. You know, I'm, I'm everything. Uh, I'm, I'm supposed to be here and everything. Um, but here's the thing. Agnes isn't even registering that he's magical. He, he she's, not registering that he just popped out of nowhere, like into existence right next to her. And he's, she's even barely registering that he's there. And I kind of feel like, um, <clears throat> at the start that this was an interesting counter to Mr. Beavis. Um, because at first I thought that it was a counter to Beavis, but it just really turns out to be uh, like, like, I mean, in terms of the entire episode, I mean, I felt like this was going to be an interesting counter to Mr. Beavis, like a, like a companion episode to it. I was hoping that it would do something different than Mr. Beavis. I was hoping that it would do something that it would take that same type of story and just do something different with it. But as the episode progressed, it really just turned out to be a direct ripoff or recycle of Mr. Beavis. Um, <clears throat> and so in this scene on the bus, this just didn't also didn't really work for me. It, it, it didn't work for me really at all because Cavender 
he is trying to convince her that he's an angel, but it's not like he's trying to convince her of it. It's it's not necessarily that he can't convince her. It's just that she seems very slow on the uptake. And I really wish that there was something more to this interaction because he is saying all of these things and she is not even acknowledging what he's saying. Um, and I just wish that there was some kind of reaction from Agnes. Any uh, any reaction at all, I think, would have been preferable. Uh, and I think that it would have been a very good opportunity to develop her character as the kind-hearted person or at least really polite and sociable person that she is. But instead, we get... We have Carol Burnett, who is, like, I don't know, at the time, I don't know how famous she was and everything, but we have Carol Burnett. She is, like, a like a goddess of comedy and everything, and we just have her sitting on the bus saying nothing while this man is telling her all of this magical stuff, and it just feels really frustrating that there's nothing there. It just, instead of, instead of having a two-hander, a back and forth between Cavender and Agnes about him explaining that he's a guardian angel and her rejecting that premise, instead, the scene just makes her completely, look completely oblivious. Like, it's like she's not even, it's not, it's like she's not even participating in the conversation at all. And it just, it just feels very off and weird. And so Cavender, having no real, ha- having not really been set up for this, then offers to change the bus into a car with a private chauffeur. Now, again, there's really no setup for this. He is just saying things as she is not responding to him. And he does his little trick. He licks his, he licks his uh, thumb and puts, puts it in his palm or whatever. And at first, the bus transforms into a horse and carriage and then transforms into a car and then back to the bus. It's a fun gag. It's fun, and I like the and I do like uh, the subtlety of the driver reacting in each shot. Like he looks like confused and, and like he looks he looks completely discombobulated, really. Um, but Agnes doesn't really react though. And again, we have freaking Carol Burnett in the role. Let her use her comedic chops. Um, it just it just doesn't make sense to me. It feels like this is this this scene is like actively trying not to be what it could be. It's actively trying not to be anything more than just the surface level, like, oh, this is a trick that the, that Cavender can do. And it just feels very weird to me that that's, that that's how it played out. Um, so the bus driver then stops the bus and tells Agnes and Cavender, who are the only passengers on the bus, that he says, when the supervisor comes, tell him I've resigned. And then he just jumps, he just dives straight through the driver's side window. That was kind of goofy. And like on my initial viewing, I didn't realize that the driver was conscious of the changes. So like that came out of nowhere for me. But when I was rewatching the episode, it became clear like he's reacting to it. So the comedy of that does does track pretty well, but it also just seems like another silly like Twilight Zone ism where it's like, okay, we'll just have him dive through a window. Um, <clears throat> kind of reminded me of Person or Persons Unknown, of course, um, and various other episodes at this point, really. But uh, as the bus is stopped, Agnes gets up and she smiles at Cavender. Um, and again, I'm not sure if she gets it yet. Um and apparently she doesn't because she says, she says, excuse me, this is my stop. And it's like, just do something, react to something that's going on like that. It's the most frustrating thing to me because this isn't a two hander comedic bit. It's like, this is, this is prime for that kind of, that kind of comedy. But instead it's just this man doing these mir- miraculous things to nothing, to a to no audience at all because she's not reacting to it, um, and I don't see the comedy in that like at all. But anyway, as she walks through the aisle and she she turns back to see Cavender, he's written Guardian Angel in the air in front of him, which I guess is to tell us that she's not believing that he's a guardian angel, but she also doesn't react to that either. So she leaves the bus again without any reaction or acknowledgement. And again, that's what kills it for me. Like, if the intention of this scene is to make her not believe him, um, like have her think, like, okay, yeah, you're you're pulling my chain. I'm not. You're not my guardian angel. That doesn't exist. If the intention is that, then have her register her disbelief in some way. If 
conversely, if she understands the magic but doesn't want to be bothered with it or she doesn't she isn't she doesn't view herself as like a helpless charity case, have her express that in some way. And if she feels that her life doesn't need improving, express that to him in some way. Because as we stand, there's nothing. There is nothing in terms of reacting to Cavender on the bus uh, from Agnes. And that is really frustrating. And then that brings us into an act break. And at this point in the episode, I didn't, I wasn't too sure about it at this point. Um, I felt like it was a little bit too silly and, <clears throat> and I didn't really like it when the show was really, I, I, it made me consider that I don't really like it when the show has really thick headed characters who take way too long to grasp the situation they're in. Um, Because that just makes it seem like it's really ridiculous and far-fetched that a person can see such extreme examples of an extraordinary or supernatural thing and have it just not even register with them. Um, And that just kind of makes it feel like a misstep because it's not about the character who uh, not understanding or not wanting to believe what's happening. Um, it's It's about just characters experiencing, like being oblivious to things going on. Um... I don't know. It just, it, it's, it's frustrating to me. So anyway, we come back from the commercial break and Agnes is walking up the steps to her apartment. Uh, she greets some kids at the bottom of the stairs and gives them candy and she's very happy and pleasant with them. And then she interacts with a bunch of residents who talk to her. She seems very well liked. She talks about, um, like, I think like a pancake recipe or something. And then one of the, one of the residents says like, Oh, Hey, how's the job? And she's like, well, you know, it it was brief. I lost it today and everything. I guess it's another, another one. Um, but I like her disposition there because she talks about losing her job, but it isn't like with sadness or anything. She's kind of accepted it and has a somewhat carefree attitude about it. And again, that is in contrast to what we are told about Agnes before in the episode with Cavender and his, and his, like, uh, <laughs> his bosses up there. Um, cause like he's working under the assumption that she needs to, her life to be improved, but she has nothing in her life that needs, that she desires to be improved upon or anything. And that's kind of where it just doesn't really gel with me. Um, so anyway, then a kid comes up and says something about his cookie. I think he says he crunched his cookie or something. And so she's like, well, you know, I have another one. Here you go. Just very pleasant, uh, very, very pleased, uh, or very, very, uh, very sunny disposition uh, for her. So Agnes then goes into her apartment and for a brief moment, she does appear lonely. She does appear like sad and 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 kind of downtrodden. And I kind of wish that the episode would have would have built upon that as well, but it doesn't. It's just like, okay, this is, I guess it's a very, very subtle look or a subtle, um, symbol that her life is maybe not like maybe her lot in life isn't what it's, what she's, what it's cracked up to be or not, not fulfilling her, but it's so brief and it's so incongruous with the rest of the story as well with the rest of her journey, really, that it doesn't really work for me as, as a bit of subtlety there. It feels like I'm kind of reaching to have some kind of character, uh, character dynamic, uh, for Agnes, um, in this, in this regard. So anyway, that's when Cavender appears on her couch, uh, which was very reminiscent of death in, uh, one for the angels. And here's the thing. (laughs) Again, she doesn't seem disturbed or even interested in him. It's just very, like her reaction is like, I don't freak out, like, like miming, uh, like mimicking him and everything. And it's fun. It's pleasant, but also it just, her disinterest in him, in his interest in improving her life makes me disinterest in viewing the episode about her, about, about his interest in improving her life. Like it just, it just doesn't connect with me as a viewer. Um, so in this, and it also just doesn't really compute to me because he immediately tries to get down to business and he starts planning out how they're going to work on her life. Um, and, but throughout every suggestion, everything that he says, every line that he says, um, she just keeps trying to derail the conversation by offering him drinks. And like, I don't know at that point, again, if she's just really thick and not grasping what's going on, or if she's trying to stall any kind of personal improvement that could come from Cavender. Um, 
like my devil's advocate thing here is that it shows her hospitality and how friendly she is, but it also doesn't say anything about her her position and her lot in life itself. And that's just where, uh, I don't know, it just, it's, I don't know, it doesn't really work for me. And so at this point, I was wondering if the story was about, uh, was going to be about a woman who refuses to embrace adult responsibilities like Mr. Beavis, sort of. Um, and I put in my notes, damn Zither music. Um, but that's really not the case either, because it's just, it, this episode is what it is. I don't know. Um and so Cavender kind of takes charge of it and he says like, okay, well, uh, I don't think you can live in this apartment anymore, so I'm going to find a new place for you. And so he uh, summons a, a notebook out of thin air and he's like, oh yeah, there's a mansion over there. You can live You can live in the mansion. And she's like, okay, well, how am I going to afford this mansion? And then, and probably my favorite piece of comedy in this episode, he says, well, there are ways. And then she says, hey, I'm not that kind of woman. <laughs> and I thought, okay, that's fine. That was that was pretty solid. That's a that's a good joke. I I like that. Um, but, um, I don't know. It just it just it's so simple the way that he just kind of like summons the money in her bank account. Like, okay, as of this moment, you are independently wealthy. And uh, I don't know. It's just at this point, I was like, okay, well, this is obviously probably going to take a turn where it's like she's given the gift of wealth and then ultimately rejects it again, kind of similar to Mr. Beavis. Um, I, and I did like this exchange between Agnes and Cavender when he's looking, when he's reading off her, um, her bank balance. Cause he says like a 19 cents. And then she says a 19 cents. And he says, I hate round numbers. And she's like, Oh yeah, me too. Like there's just this charming hint of what the two hander could have been in this episode here because them, them kind of having that little back and forth about, oh, I hate round numbers. Oh, me too. And everything. It's very, it's very friendly and fun. And it's just the briefest bit there. And that is what is ultimately, that is what ultimately makes me really dislike this episode because the chemistry is there. Like there is chemistry between uh, Jesse White and, and, and Carol Burnett. And to have it hinted at it, that this could have been a very fun two-hander episode in this moment and then for it to just go into a montage after that is maddening it's just it's so maddening so he starts looking for social activities for her and she says like well i usually go bowling on thursdays um and so he says like no 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 that's not suitable for a woman of your newfound wealth and status so he then transports her to a party transports them both to a party with high society and there's a lot of shots of like artwork on display and people kind of uh, uh, kind of just socializing in this party. And this is a very muddy montage sequence because it's clear like the party is being thrown by Agnes. We're introduced to all of these different people that come up and compliment her on the party. And they have this kind of just like everyone knows Agnes and she has friends. She has this new social circle and everyone's having a good time. They're complimenting her where uh, Agnes is visibly out of place in all of her interactions, specifically because she she immediately recognizes she doesn't belong there. Like, this is not who she is as a person. And that's what's kind of frustrating about it, too, is that, like, okay, Cavender just assumed, like, okay, wealth and status is what you need, so let's just go ahead and do this. And it's just a, an immediate just 180 from her life, which I, I respect on like I respect on paper. I respect that this is the thing that the show is doing to show that okay, this person doesn't need wealth and and uh wealth wealth and contentment um to be happy and everything. I understand that. I just think that the episode should have gone about it a different way, not done a montage um with all of these weird like uh interactions and everything. And the the montage or time lapse whatever you want to call it it's it's fine like it has some moments um i do like agnes being out of place in all the interactions and there's this interesting uh like chipmunk noise that's used to speed up time throughout the time lapse of the of the montage but like then like there's there's like a scene where a man comes up and like starts licking her fingers which is weird and then later he comes up i think and starts kissing her up her arms um, and it's just like, that's just so gross and weird. And, and 
out of place. Um, so uh, the party continues. I didn't, I didn't bother putting down notes for every interaction or anything, but Agnes continues being uncomfortable and completely out of place in, in her new surroundings. And then the aftermath comes. Cavender wakes up on the couch in the mansion and he calls for Agnes, but she's nowhere to be found. He's, he finds her shoes. They're, they're, um, <clears throat> not with her. Um, <laughs> they're, they're independent of her feet. And so he has lost, uh, Agnes. So what he does is he teleports back to the apartment and she comes down and she is very, very morose about it. She says that the apartment's been rented and the landlord didn't recognize her. Um, and then her neighbor came out and to get the paper and her still being like dressed up in like very elegant clothing asked if she was slumming it, um, by being there. And she's very upset. She's very, um, uh, disheartened about this and everything, which this is probably my favorite bit of acting from Carol Burnett in this episode, because you really feel like the empathy of the character. Like you, I, at least I really empathized with her character in this moment that she's very hurt that she's like in, in an effort to improve her life. Kavanagh has erased everything good from her life. Um, and you can really feel that in Carol Burnett's performance there. Um, and so Kavanagh just kind of levels with her and says like, well, you know, the old adage, you can't have your cake and eat it too, which is this, that right there bothers me a lot because I think that it's a, it's a fault of the episode in terms of the writing and everything, because it's not like she was visibly distraught over not being able to keep the movie theater job. Like there's nothing in this episode that really makes it makes the case for her to have her life upended. There's no, there's no, if it is, if this episode is borrowing off of it's a wonderful life, there's no scene of the money missing or anything that causes her to commit suicide or to contemplate suicide or anything to be shown like what her life would be like or anything. There's no like inciting incident there aside from being fired from the movie theater, which then we see her to the only time she really talks about it. She says it in a kind of pleasant way. Like, well, you know, lost another job. It's fine. It's, it's very kind of just incongruous with it. So, um, it just bothers me that like Cavender's whole plan is that he just assumes that the answer to everything is just a complete lifestyle upheaval with no money problems or anything, which to be completely frank, I get that. <laughs> that would be nice, but like to put her into a completely different like social circle and everything is, is just, is weird. So I don't know. Um, so then Cavender says the whole philosophy of life is a give and take kind of thing. And what did you expect? And then Agnes, and this this feels like it's a line from uh, from a uh, from a different draft of the episode because this is like, and this is very heartfelt because she very sadly says that she expected well friends maybe, and I wish that there was more of that. I wish that that was the the big thing with her in this episode is that she lost her friends like like the the social circle and everything. Um, the change of the social circles is like the big thing with her in this episode, but it's not given enough time to really develop or any time really to develop to, to develop. So while I think that that could be kind of the theme of the episode, that it comes down to desire versus happiness, um, I guess. But then again, did she even desire the mansion and money? She didn't. She didn't because she didn't really care about losing the job. She was just thrust into high society and it just, it didn't, it didn't work, but I don't know. Um, I'm struggling with that. Like that, it just, it doesn't connect with me all that well, but, um, I don't know. I did, I did like this in my notes, just kind of to pat myself on the back. If she's thrust into high society, the fish out of water will suffocate in the air. Um, because that's inherently not who she is as a person. And I think that that does make sense for just kind of com having a complete um <clears throat> having like a complete uh to I oh god a complete narrative arc for her um it's just showing that like that like okay okay she could have everything but she'll be miserable so she'll go back to you know struggling and and uh, and, and kind of working through hardships and everything, but being happy, that's fine. Like that's a, that's a great noble, um, 
kind of theme to play with and everything. But again, she there's nothing in the episode that really makes me think that she desired to have a mansion and be wealthy and be uh, a socialite and everything. There's nothing in that. So that just makes that whole excursion feel like a wasted a waste of time really and an underdeveloped uh plot thread so anyway they walk outside of the building and agnes tries to say hi to the milkman but he ignores her and cavender uh is kind of also oblivious in his own way because he's like okay well let's get you back to the mansion and so she's like no i want to stay here i want my apartment back and so Cavender is like, no, that can't be, you know, 24 hours of miracles. And if I leave you here, how I met you, I'm not going to get my wings. Um, and then he says, uh, he asks her, don't you want to be happy? And then that's when uh, she's like, well, you know, I was happy and everything. Um, and like I put in my notes, like he's a really crappy guardian angel. Then, <laughs> um, And she's like, you know, I'm happy being uh, you know, behind on my rent and, and not knowing where I'm going to work and everything and discombobulated, uh, which is another, another use of that word. Um, Serling used it in the opening narration for Mr. Beavis. And now it's uh, come back to here. Um, <clears throat> so again, I'm going to kind of rehash what I said before, but if the episode is meant to be a riff on it's a wonderful life, it really should have had some kind of inciting incident that caused Agnes to reconsider her life or want something more out of it. Because getting fired from the theater only to all but shrug it off when talking to the neighbors is nowhere near enough of of a building block for the character or anything. So, I don't know. That's just still frustrating to me. <laughs> uh, so, Cavender says that uh, he thinks that, you know, he, she's making a mistake, but he's going to set things back the way they were. Um, then he kind of looks up to, uh, to the heavens and says that he tried. Um... And so we get this nice kind of reversal of the earlier scene of her going through the apartment because she runs back into the building. She's excited and she's interacting with everyone. Um, there's a lot of callbacks to her interactions at the beginning of the episode. And <laughs> I forgot that I put this in my notes, but I put in my notes, Merry Christmas, you old building alone, uh, because it is very much that it's a wonderful life scene, basically. Um and then I thought this is just this is this is a completely reductive read of of the story and of the episode and everything. But I put I put in my notes that I mean, can't Cavender just keep her bank account filled? Like can't like she can keep her life the way she likes it, but maybe rent is okay for like maybe she can get paid up on her rent. Um, because that's probably what I would do or what I would want out of it. Um again, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Um anyway. Uh, Agnes then, when she gets back to her apartment, she calls down to Cavender and says, thanks, but no thanks. And then again, riff of It's a Wonderful Life. Cavender literally says that he's the, that she's the richest woman he knows. Like that's, that's, it's a wonderful life. And I don't know. I just kind of wondered, and this might be blasphemous. Um, and I mean, no disrespect to Serling at all, of course, but I wondered if this is indicative of Serling being kind of burnt out this late in the season. And I'm excited to finish out season three because I'm going to then read up on, you know, the production of season four because I know that there was a lot of big changes and everything, um, especially with it going to an hour long. I want to say that Buck Houghton left the production in season four. I don't know. I'll learn all of that in the weeks to come. But um but I just kind of feel like this, it felt just kind of lazy. And, and it, it's a bummer to think that because Serling is so gifted with his, with his writing that it's, it's bad or it's, it's sad when there's a clunker thrown in. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I didn't understand this either. So I think Agnes says, I had to travel a long way to find out that cash and contentment aren't necessarily synonymous. Um, or maybe, Maybe, maybe Cavender said that. I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, she says, I don't understand this line. Uh, Agnes says, goodbye and don't take any wooden angels. Like, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand if that's an expression that is like lost on my millennial brain. Um, or, or if that's something that I missed in the episode itself, but that was just kind of confusing. So anyway, as we wind down the episode, thunder kind of claps and Cavender looks up and says, what's that, Chief? You want to talk to me? Okay, I'll be right up. And, like, I kind of I kind of liked this uh, because Cavender leaves, and then we're back in the clouds with the angels, and he's being reprimanded by his superior. And it has, like, it has all the markings of, like, that 
that tropish like cop character like <coughs> excuse me that cop drama of uh of a character being reprimanded by his superior officer or whatever like um <laughs> like uh he says cavender you're a disgrace to the entire service and i don't know it just it, i thought it was really charming and funny because it really has that like whole like oh you're a loose cannon kind of thing um so then he says that it means reclassification for cavender um which i don't really think the i don't think that there is a strong impression of why that's that's bad um uh, in the episode um i i understand like i can infer what it means but i don't understand i don't think it's communicated enough in the episode to really make it as 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 big of an event as it should be so <clears throat> anyway they then look down at Agnes from the heavens and they see that she's happy and she's bowling and they make a remark about how like, are you supposed to, aren't you supposed to let go of the ball? And he's like, well, she's still learning. Um, that was kind of funny. That was, it was funny. Um, and, and overall, I kind of feel like the comedy was landing a little bit better than what I remember it, what I remember landing in Mr. Beavis. But then again, there's also kind of few and far between comedy bits in this that, that really work overall. So I don't know. But anyway, the episode ends with Cavender's boss reconsidering and telling him that there are more people that he will be assigned to, um, uh, which is sad because the show didn't go forward or anything, but uh, it lives on in the Twilight Zone. And then we get Rod's closing narration, which I will play right now. A word to the wise now to any and all who might suddenly feel the presence of a cigar-smoking helpmate who takes bank books out of thin air. If you're suddenly aware of any such celestial aids, it means that you're under the beneficent care of one Harmon Cavender, guardian angel. And this message from the Twilight Zone. Lots of luck. And even that, like, lots of luck thing at the end just seems ill-fitting for the episode because, I don't know, I guess it's saying, like, good luck dealing with Cavender, but it also is like, okay, well, you know, he's going to be the star of a show that if you can sell it, so it's kind of weird. Like, I don't think it's, I don't think it really works well to have it be more bumbling than anything, but I don't know, but... Overall, I just really didn't like this episode. Um, the humor works fine when it when it hits. Um, and I feel like there is such a a missed opportunity for a very, very uh, a very uh, a, a much more fun two hander to to be played out between Jesse White and and Carol Burnett that just isn't in the episode. And that's a shame because I think that that like they left talent on the table there. Um, and really I just struggled to get into the story and I didn't find much substance within it. And it's funny because like I, when the, when the credits rolled, I thought, oh my God, that's Carol Burnett. I didn't even recognize her. I didn't know. I'm, I'm frankly, I'm not terribly familiar with her or anything. I know her legacy, but I'm not too familiar with her. Um, so it's understandable that I didn't, imme- didn't immediately see her as the, as the lead, but nothing in the script or in the performance made me think that this episode would have like a special guest star quality to it. Not like once upon a time with Buster Keaton and like them playing into Buster Keaton's like physical comedy and everything. This just felt like this felt like Cavender is the star and Carol Burnett is the supporting player who is going to support Cavender as a character and not really have anything to break out on her own. And that just seems very wrong to me. <laughs> like it seems very, very much like it just doesn't doesn't really compute for me. So I don't know. But anyway, those are my thoughts on Cavender is coming. A couple pieces of trivia to to go through is that an unaired version of this episode uh, actually included a laugh track, um, and it was weird because like trivia online says that the episode originally aired with a laugh track, and then subsequent um, uh, syndication was like removed it. But I haven't found anything online to cor- to corroborate that. I've just seen that uh, there was an unaired version of the episode that included a laugh track. So I'm not sure. But it would have been interesting to um, to see it with a laugh track. But uh, I could not find a version of it anywhere. So um, I don't know. I'm sure it's probably lost to time. Um, again, obviously, this is uh, this episode bears strong similarities to Mr. Beavis. Both episodes are comedies about guardian angels who try to help kind-hearted but hapless human beings by giving them everything they think they desire, 
only to discover that the humans are happier with the way of life they had previously. Um, so I'm not sure why Rod Serling had that like in his in his head so so much to have two episodes um, about it. But yeah, I don't know. But anyway, um, the entire um, opening segment about her being an usherette that was taken from Carol Burnett's actual experience um, as a I think when she was 15. She worked as a cinema usherette, and uh, according to trivia, she was fired from a job uh, at the Hollywood's uh, Warner Brothers Theater, which was owned by an eccentric man who who forbade the usherettes from speaking to him and communicated exclusively with hand signals. And uh, at her... uh, That's awesome. Um, At her request, Carol Burnett had her star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame placed directly in front of the theater's a uh, former address uh, at Hollywood and Wilcox. That's awesome. Um, but um, <clears throat> so, uh, like I said, Rod Serling earlier in the episode, I Rod Serling wrote the episode specifically for Carol Burnett, and then he eventually like added in more of her own, like her experiences as the as the usherette. So a lot of the things in that opening scene actually happened to her and everything, uh, which is is pretty pretty funny. Um, yeah, and I guess that that's really all the trivia I have. So, um, yeah, overall thoughts on Cavender is coming. I really didn't like the episode all that much. Um, it was, it was, I mean, I didn't even like, I didn't even like Mr. Beavis. So to have an episode that is so much like Mr. Beavis work, not even uh, like work just about as well as Mr. Beavis, it's, it's not going to really, um, work for me overall. So unfortunately, Cavender is Coming is not my favorite episode. Um, And it it is, it is, honestly, it's pretty forgettable. So those are my thoughts on Cavender is Coming. And uh, yeah, now I'm going to wrap up the episode with my brief review of Who Is This Man from Science Fiction Theater Season 2, Episode 3. So to bring us into that segment, I'm going to go ahead and play the uh, theme music for Science Fiction Theater. So, Who Is This Man originally aired on April 20th, 1956. It is the third episode of Science Fiction Theater's second season. Um, The episode is available on YouTube in the plot synopsis, courtesy of IMDb. Is uh, Tommy Cooper's shyness is so crippling, he's failing his college courses. At the request of his sister, Dr. Bentley of the the uh, psychology department, Puts Tommy under hypnosis to find the cause of his fears. Um, This episode was directed by William Castle and written by Charles Smith. It stars Bruce Bennett as Dr. Hugh Bentley. This is his second of five science fiction theater episodes. And it co-stars David Alpert as Dr. Owen, his second of third science fiction theaters. Uh, playing Carl Krauss is Harold uh, Harlow Wilcox is only science fiction theater, and rounding out the cast as Tommy Cooper is Charles Smith. Uh, this is his only episode of science fiction theater, but also I think that he's also the writer of the episode. Like it's interesting because um, his IMDb is the same. Like the, they have the same IMDb, but he's credited as the writer. He's credited as Charles B. Smith. And as an actor, he's credited as Charles Smith. So it's kind of interesting. I haven't really seen that in science fiction theater before. So pretty interesting. So, uh, so yeah, so this episode, like I hinted at, at the beginning of this podcast, uh, was really good. I actually really enjoyed it. Um, it, at the beginning, Truman Bradley introduces, uh, a quote unquote new concept in science where he shows us, uh, various animals that are uh, <laughs> that are frozen, basically. Um, and then he says, like, they look dead, but they're not dead. And then he starts, like, messing with them. <laughs> and, like, he, like, throws, like, a, a chicken across the room. And he kind of, like, wakes up one of them and everything. It's just basically, he says, like, okay, they're hypnotized. Um, and he introduces this concept of hypnotizing animals, like, having, like, like if you if you rub the belly of an alligator um 
or something or if you rub rub a chicken's underside it will it will you know become hypnotized um it reminds me a lot of the kind of internet phenomenon of having like a circle of tape in the center of a of a room and a, pl- placing a cat in it and a cat not like moving out of it um so anyway so then he ends that demonstration by saying that you know A man's nervous system is much more complicated than an animal's, but could we be hypnotized the same way? Um, So then the episode progresses. Uh, We get into the episode proper. Like I said, it's a very good episode. It kind of begins with this professor uh, having put a student under hypnosis with a coin, and then he introduces the concept of regression and regressive thinking and about how, like, okay, you can, uh, like, you can you can you can resurface or you can dig up past memories under hypnosis so he asked the student about like you know memories from when he was four and then before the bell rings he uh, a student asks about pre pre-birth regression and uh the the professor is like well you know that's not really a thing like you know it's not not really a thing or whatever it's very much hinting that it is going to be a thing in the episode And that made me very interested and very excited because I really like that idea, this kind of idea of pre-birth regression in which you hypnotize someone and they can remember their past lives and everything. It is like something that I would love to see in like a modern sci-fi movie, um, which I'm sure it's been done to death and everything. But um, but yeah, I was very, very interested in that. So then as everyone's being dismissed, a student comes up and... uh, asks uh, a favor um and she eventually gets to the point where she is asking if she if he can hypnotize her brother because he's shy he can't function well and he's afraid of all animals um so that's demonstrated by him being in like a cafeteria and being bullied by someone who has like a rat uh, and that freaks him out and he runs away and everything so having seen that the professor agrees to go ahead and put Tommy under hypnosis to try to like solve his problem of being afraid of animals and being afraid of uh, like uh, basically being an introvert, basically. So he does so, and I'm not going to give too much more away, but it's really interesting because when he puts him under hypnosis, Tommy remembers something that he should not remember from a time in which he was not alive and he becomes another person. And it's basically him remembering a past life. And I really, really like that. And the episode, the way the route that it goes is pretty, pretty satisfying overall, because it goes down a rabbit hole of it to where uh, it's very clear, like, okay, we introduce this, this concept that he has a past life as this, this individual from 1889 or something. Um, So we have that established. And then from there, the professor talks to the rest of the psychology department and they're all like, well, you know, that, that can't be true or anything. And or I think he says that. And then one of his, one of his colleagues says, and I wrote down this line cause I thought it was great says, well, what does that say about us? Like if science accepts what only what it knows to be fact, we would never advance. And I'm like, that is awesome. That's fantastic. So he develops a plan uh, to utilize the past life memories and everything Uh, to the benefit of Tommy. And I'm not going to say what he does or what what happens, but there are some adverse effects to that that I found really interesting. It kind of goes into the play, uh, goes into that whole idea that uh, I've been kind of wrestling with or noticing in in these season two episodes of science fiction theater, because there is a bit of action that's developed in this this, uh, episode. Like it's not... This is like the third consecutive episode where something happens that facilitates or or necessitates like a choreographed action sequence, basically. And it's satisfying. It's interesting. Um, And I'm I'm so glad that that doesn't, at least in this episode, hasn't made, um, doesn't take away from any of the science stuff because I really like the ideas and the concepts that's at play here. So I'm not going to give away what happens at the end or anything. But I did really enjoy uh, this episode of uh, Science Fiction Theater. Uh, Who is this man? And I do have a couple of pieces of trivia as well. Um, From IMDb, uh, I found, like, I'll just read from IMDb. 
Quote, this episode was aired in 1956 during the height of the Bridie Murphy mania. Uh, in 1952, a self-taught hypnotist with no background in psychology, quote unquote, regressed a housewife to her supposed previous life as Bridie Murphy in 19th century Ireland. The housewife recounted enough details of this life to fill a best-selling book and subsequent hit movie. However, when reporters investigated the details, it turned out that Bridget Murphy never existed and the details about 19th century Ireland were all wrong. Uh, I found that to be pretty, pretty interesting. And I should have delved more into that, but, uh, but I didn't. But that's pretty interesting. And then the, the other piece of trivia I have is that the opening sequence, as I described it, as being Truman Bradley talking about... Um, <clears throat> talking about animal hypnosis and being able to make them freeze. Like that's the, it's not right. <laughs> like, uh, the quote from the trivia says the opening sequence shows animal hypnotism. These are examples of tonic mobility, uh, where an animal freezes when faced by a threat. Many species, possibly even humans display this reflexive behavior. Um, so that makes me bummed out a little bit at the opening of this episode because, I kind of feel like it's really messing with animals in a very, very negative way. Um, but, you know, it, this was 1956. So, um, okay, well, that is my uh, head cold ridden 100th episode of Anthology. I really hope you guys uh, didn't mind uh, any faux pas in editing or anything that I may have uh, because I did have to cough quite a bit throughout this uh, recording. Um, and clear my throat. So hopefully that wasn't too distracting. Next time on Anthology, I am going to be reviewing the final episode of The Twilight Zone, Season 3, The Changing of the Guard. I really can't wait to talk about this one because, I mean, this this season ends on on a, a big note because I, I was so moved by The Changing of the Guard. So very much looking forward to that. The bonus review that I'm going to be doing for that episode is The Green Bomb, which is season two, episode four of Science Fiction Theater. Um, I'm going to start playing myself out. I just want to say thank you guys so much for listening and for uh, spending the last hour and a half or so of your time with me. Uh, once again, you can check out more Patreon, more content on Patreon at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer or check out my other shows, Obsessive Viewer and Tower Junkies. Um, but until next time, thank you guys so much for listening and I'll see you in the next episode of Anthology. And now, enjoy this short clip from our Patreon-exclusive RSS feed. For the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, such as early access to episodes, TV book and movie reviews and reaction recordings, commentary tracks, and Patreon poopery episodes, go to patreon.com slash obsessive viewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. And then the last hour is is Kang the Conqueror going, to, like, doing his thing. And that's fine, but that first hour is so kind of irritating to me. It is, it is kind of, it's very much annoying to me um, because that first hour is essentially just... Here, here's what I said to the reps out, outside of the theater um, when they were asking for feedback for the studio. I said that the first hour felt like Marvel doing Star Wars cosplay, and then the the when Kang showed up and and the story actually got going proper, it really worked for me, and it was really it was it would hit hit a groove that was very much in my in my wheelhouse. Now, what I mean by it being Star Wars cosplay is that Quantumania takes place almost entirely in the quantum realm. Um, basically, Scott, uh, Scott Lang, uh, Cassie, his daughter. Um... This podcast was edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. You can find links to all of our shows at ObsessiveViewer.com slash podcasts. For exclusive bonus content, including reviews, commentaries, and B-roll episodes, you can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.